In the past, if you think about entrepreneurs, you think about Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, you think mostly dudes. Now you see people like Kylie Jenner. She is now on the cover of Forbes as one of the youngest billionaires for creating Kylie Cosmetics on her own. We are living through an entrepreneurial renaissance. Kylie is an entrepreneur, a lawyer, and the president of Shopify. I sat down in the tax law class at the beginning of the lecture as an aspiring entrepreneur. And in that three hour lecture, I built store 136 on Shopify. And I walked out of that lecture as an entrepreneur selling t-shirts all over the world that opened my eyes to what is possible when you marry ambition and technology. The only thing you need right now is ambition. A lot of people would assume it's not a good time to start a business, but you say otherwise. This is an unbelievable time because it's... Harley, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Very, very honored. Yeah, I'm really excited about today's show, Young and Profiters. It's going to be a great day for all of us side hustlers and entrepreneurs because we have Harley Finkelstein in the building. Harley is an entrepreneur, a lawyer, and the president of Shopify, which is a top commerce platform and one of our long-term sponsors at Young and Profiting Podcast. Harley is also an advisor to Felicious Ventures and one of the dragons on CBC's Next Gen Den, which is essentially Canada's version of Shark Tank. He also recently co-founded Firebelly, a modern high-end tea brand, and is the host of a new podcast called Big Shot. In this episode, we're going to unpack Harley's lifelong journey as a serial entrepreneur, and we'll learn how he went from being one of the first users on Shopify to eventually leading the company as its president. We'll discover why Harley believes we are currently in an entrepreneurial renaissance. We'll pick his brain on the future of e-commerce and we'll gain insight on how to thrive in our new connect to consumer world. So Harley, let's start off with your background story. You call yourself a lifelong entrepreneur and it turns out entrepreneurship actually runs in your genes. Can you tell us a bit about your family history and why you call your parents forced entrepreneurs? Yeah, well, entrepreneurship for me, uh, has always been about solving a problem. It's sort of the tool that I've pulled out of my tool belt um, since I was a kid because I wanted to do something and, and it was a challenge. And so the tool that I would use to solve that challenge would be entrepreneurship. That is very different than uh, what my, my, my father, my mother, my grandparents went through. My father came to Canada from Hungary in 1956 and his parents were Holocaust survivors. Really, they had a really, he sort of had a rough time growing up. But they immigrated from Hungary uh, during the Hungarian Revolution to come to Canada in, in when he was a, a little boy. And when my grandfather, his father, came to Canada, he didn't have a job, obviously. He didn't speak the language. He had no money. And so the only thing that that he had that was accessible to him in terms of making money, putting food on the table, was starting a small business. And he spent pretty much his entire life until he passed away a few years ago selling eggs at a farmer's market. He, he got a little kiosk and found a couple farmers and began to sell eggs uh, to, to, uh, to consumers. My father had sort of a similar, uh, similar experience when after he, he finished uh, school, after he finished college, he was looking around trying to get a job, couldn't find one. And he himself also used entrepreneurship as a way to solve his problem. In his case, he was starting a young family and he needed to make money. And so it wasn't as dire as my grandfather, but entrepreneurship and, and becoming an entrepreneur for my father was also about survival. If you fast forward till, I guess, 1996 or so, I'm 13 years old. I'm living in Canada at the time, and I want to be a DJ. I was going, I'm Jewish. I was going to a lot of bar and bat mitzvahs at the time. And I just thought DJs were just the coolest people I'd ever encountered. They were these magicians where they would take a group of people, a couple hundred people that were sitting down, that were lethargic, that were eating their dinners. And within a matter of minutes, they would have them doing a conga line. I mean, it was just, to me, it was, it was magic. And so I really, I want to be a DJ. And so I called around a couple DJ companies and of course, nobody would hire me. I was 13 years old. I had never had, I had no experience as DJ. I probably looked like I was eight years old. Uh, and so it just, there, there was just no way it was going to happen. And my father said, well, why don't you start your own DJ company and hire yourself? And I did. And although my parents didn't have a lot of money, the one thing they did help me with was they, they would make me these business cards. Every crazy little idea I had as a kid, my dad would print these business cards on, on the family computer. Um, and and so that was sort of the first time where I realized that this, this idea, this concept called entrepreneurship is not only a great way to survive and a great way to you know, put food on the table, but also most things that I wanted to do, most challenges that I encounter, what if I took an entrepreneurial approach to that? And 
um, I've been sort of building companies ever since. I love that. And it's so true what you're saying. Sometimes we're waiting for gatekeepers to tell us yes or to give us a job to hire us. But if we take agency over our own lives, start, you know, figuring out how we can leverage our passions and our hobbies to create a business, we can go ahead and do what we want to do. And we don't really need permission from anybody else to do so. The number one question I get often um, when people find out that I'm the president of Shopify, and you know, Shopify, as, as, as you obviously uh, know very well, more than most people, you know, we want to be the entrepreneurship company. We want to be the place where people go with an idea. And on the other side of our software, they end up with a business. In some cases, maybe a multi-billion dollar business that changes the world or changes their industry, like you know, an Allbirds or a Figs or a Gymshark has done on Shopify. So the question I often get is, okay, I, I love the idea of entrepreneurship. I'm creative, I'm ambitious, but I don't know what to start. I don't know what business to go into. And what's so fascinating is after a line of some very simple questioning, it becomes so obvious to them exactly what they should start. And so I, I start by asking them, you know, what are you into? Uh, what is your hobby? What do you do on Sunday afternoons when you're tinkering? What do you do, you know, in the shower in the morning? What are you thinking about? I mean, what kind of ideas? And often they're like, well, you know, I've like, I, I've been tinkering on this, this idea for a while. And I, I think that I want to make the most beautiful, you know, kitchen appliance. And it's, it's really cool. But, you know, I, I kind of built it for myself and there's like duct tape on it. And I, I kind of rebuild the motor. And I'm like, well, why don't you consider building that for other people. In other cases, it's something as simple as, I love making beautiful you know, blankets for my grandchildren. And I, I knit these beautiful blankets and all my grandchildren, and, and the next, obviously the next comment is, well, what if other people would, would find value in, in your blankets? And they would say, well, wait a second, maybe, maybe that's it. And it's so funny that, that there are so many people searching for what they can start their entrepreneurial journey doing when in fact, it's literally right in front of them. And that's not to say that everybody needs to commercialize their hobby. Some things should just be hobbies. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I love yakitori barbecue. I'm not going to be ever become a yakitori chef. It's just not, but I, I love, I enjoy making it for my, for my kids and for my wife and for my friends. So some hobbies can be hobbies by themselves, but a lot of the time, the hobbies, the things that we tinker on, you know, in our garage after work uh, on nights and weekends, that may actually be the thing that becomes your life's work. And it's right in front of you. Yeah, totally. And sometimes you start a business just to get you by through a certain period. So for example, when you were in business and law school, from my understanding, you had a t-shirt company. Did, and yeah. that's how you decided to pay your way through school. You weren't getting money from your parents. And you also wanted to make sure you were able to go to school full time. So you decided, I can't get a job. I need to just have my own business. So tell us about this t-shirt company and how it enabled you to thrive during your college years. So uh, I mentioned when I was 13, I became a DJ. Uh, shortly thereafter, my family and I, we've moved, we, moved to, uh, we left Canada, moved to South Florida. And I went to high school there. And all throughout high school, I was tinkering on this DJ business and was, was DJing parties for friends and DJing weddings and DJing all types of corporate events. And it was really fun. I made a little bit of money, but more importantly, I really got deep into entrepreneurship. You know, when my friends were, you know, playing sports on weekends, I was trying to figure out um, how to expand the business to figure out what new equipment could I buy that I could rent out to, to clients. And in 2001, I finished high school and I moved to Montreal, back to Canada to go to McGill. And that was the year where our family really suffered some, some real hardship. My dad was no longer around. Um, and my mom and sisters, I have two much younger sisters, needed support. And so I knew that I wanted to once again use this tool called entrepreneurship that I had been working on all throughout high school to solve that problem. Uh, the problem was, was as follows. I wanted, I, I was a, a first year student in a new city and I loved, I loved going to school. I wanted to be a student. I wanted to be a regular college kid, uh, mm -hmm. meaning I want to take a full course load, but I also needed to support my mom and sisters. And, and without my dad being around, it just, it felt, it felt like I had to do something different. Working a part-time job was not going to pay the bills. And I wasn't willing to take a, a part-time or a, a reduced course load. And so I began to ask around, you know, what kind of business do you think I should start? Just like people ask me now. And a friend of mine said, you know, McGill University uh, spends a lot of money making t on t-shirts, promotional t-shirts. So the first day of school, you get a t-shirt, a bag, and a hat that says McGill or says whatever school you go to. Uh, a friend of mine said, you know, you should consider maybe doing that. And, and when I thought about it, I had two unfair advantages. The first unfair advantage was I was a student. So therefore, I was potentially going to be making t-shirts for myself, which mm. I thought had the potential for me to have, you know, um, an unfair amount of, of empathy 
because I literally was in the shoes of the people that were, or I guess in the t-shirts in, this, in that case, of the people that I was going to sell t-shirts to. So one, I felt an unfair advantage because I myself was going to be a consumer of the product I was going to make. And the second thing was Montreal has a very rich um, w w schmutz industry, a garment industry. It's, it's you know, mm -hmm. some of the biggest clothing companies on the planet were built out of Montreal. So I knew that I had access to screen printing machines and I had access to people that had been in the business for a long time if I only, you know, I just had to find them. And so all throughout college, all throughout my undergraduate degree, I made t-shirts for universities. It started with McGill and then it expanded. By the end of my undergrad, I was making, you know, t-shirts for dozens of universities all across Canada. And um, I would say that was me really, fo the focus there was really more on forced entrepreneurship rather than passion-driven entrepreneurship. I liked mm. t-shirts, but I, that wasn't really what I wanted. That wasn't going to be my life's work. It was it was a means to an end, and I, I needed to make money. And it turned out it was it was a really good business. We didn't make a ton of money, but we made enough money that I was able to afford tuition and help my mom and sisters. A mentor of mine convinced me, uh, and as I was finishing college, to consider going to law school. And the the hypothesis at the t that, that he had at the time was, um, law school will be like finishing school for entrepreneurship. You'll learn how to write better, how to be more articulate, how to think differently, how to critical reason. And this particular mentor happened to be teaching law at the University of Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. And he said, why don't you apply to the University of Ottawa Law School? And if you move here, you know, at least you'll have me in town because I'm going to be teaching there next year. And so I, I applied to one school, uh, University of Ottawa, I luckily got in. And I moved to Ottawa in 2005, had no friends, had no family here. And the second I moved here, I did what I always had done was I tried to find my tribe. And by that point in my life, I was 21 when I started law school. My tribe were the entrepreneurs. They were the people that I just, I always got along with them. It, they felt like, I don't know, it felt like a real community. And even though all the different entrepreneurs were all in different industries, there's something that, that like when you start a business and you're responsible for payroll, you're responsible for covering the costs and covering overhead, Something changes, some some sort of chemical, you know, changes in your brain. And the only other people that really can understand you are other entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so I'd asked where all the, the entrepreneurs hung out, and I was directed to a coffee shop, and I met a group of really incredible young entrepreneurs. And one of those entrepreneurs was this, you know, programmer, this brilliant programmer named Toby, and he had just moved to Canada from Germany. And he was telling me that he had built this online t-shirt store and he thought the t-shirt, excuse me, online snowboard store, and he thought the snowboards were a good idea, but the software behind the snowboard store was a really great idea. And he was going to stop selling snowboards and focus on the software and allow other people to build beautiful online stores. And I thought that was an amazing next, you know, next um, evolution or next addition for my t-shirt business, moving from promotional t-shirts to direct-to-consumer retail t-shirts. And I became one of the first customers to use Shopify in 2006. It's so cool. You know, Shopify is such a big household name now. And to think that it really started off as a shop where Toby was selling snowboards and he just thought, oh, uh, from my understanding, people were asking him, can I use this software for my own business? So let's talk about what it was like to start a business before Shopify. Like, how did Shopify really revolutionize small business? Okay, so um, let's talk about the history of entrepreneurship. And if you go back, if you think about the history of entrepreneurship, it is the history of currency, which is about as old as time. So the idea of starting a business, the idea of commercializing something, selling something to somebody else, uh, you know, goes back thousands and thousands of years. And the problem, I think, is that the main ingredient historically to starting a business was capital. You needed money. Mm -hmm. And so... If you, if you read any, you know, business books about, you know, the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds or the Vanderbilts, in every one of those early stories, there's always a banker or a bank involved. Someone goes to the bank mm -hmm. and takes out a loan. And then with that loan, with that capital, you know, buys infrastructure, buys a building, buys raw materials, hires somebody. And so effectively, up until very recently, you needed money to start a business, which Okay, if you had access to money, that's great. But most people, I certainly had no access to money, so that was out of the question for me. But it also meant that if you if the business did not work out, the cost of failure was dramatic. Mm -hmm. So much so that in many cases, even still today, when people take out these bank loans to start a business, they're leveraging their house, 
They're taking a second mortgage out. If they don't have a mortgage, they take a mortgage on their house. They're using credit card debt in some cases because they have no other access to capital. But that idea that you needed money to start a business is so very much baked into the fabric of, of entrepreneurship. And what I think changed in the kind of early 2000s as the internet began to become more prevalent, as access to the internet from a consumer perspective became more prevalent, was all of a sudden, for the first time maybe in the history of the world, the main ingredient was no longer just capital. It was beginning to shift towards resourcefulness. Because what happened was technology, software in particular, gave anyone leverage. It gave everyone these superpowers. And so here you have this brilliant immigrant from Germany who comes to Canada in the early 2000s because he met a girl here in Ottawa. And he needs to, he needs to get a job. He can't get a regular job because he's, he doesn't have his, you know, he's not a landed, he doesn't have his working papers. He's not a landed, you know, citizen of Canada. He doesn't have a social ins insurance or security number. But he's told, hey, you can go start a business. And he looks around and he sees there's lots of snow in Canada and decides I'm going to start a snowboard business. And then he looks at what tools are on the market to do so. And you basically have two options. You either have to sell on a marketplace where, you know, like an eBay or an Etsy type marketplace at the time, where, you know, it, it's easy to sell, but you're not really building your own business. You're effectively renting customers from, mm -hmm. uh, from the marketplace. Or you have to spend a million dollars to have a company like IBM build you uh, an online store. The ingenuity and, and the thoughtfulness of Toby's decision was, I don't, I think I can do better. What if I wrote a piece of software myself to allow me to sell these snowboards? I can have independence. I can have a direct relationship. It's not going to cost me a million dollars. And that was really the genesis of Snow Devil, which was the, that original snowboard shop. So here, so now, now you're in 2004, 2005 or so, and there's very few online stores. E-commerce as a percentage of total retail is probably sub 2% at the time, like 98% of retail is still happening in brick and mortar stores. Maybe one or 2% mm -hmm. is happening online. I'm being generous there. Um, but Toby has built the software to sell these snowboards. And, and he starts talking about the journey of, of building an online store. And because of his relationships in the Ruby on Rails community and because of his relationships in the entrepreneurship community, he's hearing from all these different entrepreneurs like me saying, hey, what you built here is dramatically better than anything out there. Maybe I can build an online store. Maybe I can try my hand at, 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 at modern retail. And so by focusing on the software rather than the snowboards, he's been able to change the, the main ingredients. And Shopify has been able to change the main ingredients in terms of what do you need to build a great business. And effectively, the last 15 years or so has been spent on inviting as many people as, as possible to join this idea of entrepreneurship. If you have an idea in the shower and you have ambition, it's interesting. Nike did this really well. Nike convinced the entire world that if you have a body, like an actual human body, you are an athlete as opposed mm. to if you get paid to play professional sports, you're an athlete, or if you play you know, division one football, you're an athlete. Nike can convince anyone that if you have a body, you, you are an athlete, and therefore they sold shoes to athletes, which you know, are, is everybody. I think what we're trying to do with Shopify is we're trying, to, we're trying to do something similar, which is if you have ambition, if you have interesting ideas gnawing at you in the shower and while you're walking you know, to the bus or where you're on your way to work or in the car sitting in traffic during your morning commute, maybe you are an entrepreneur. And the idea of transitioning mm -hmm. from aspirational entrepreneur to actual practical entrepreneur, I think is made possible or made much eat much more possible because of software like Shopify. And today we have millions of stores on the platform. I think we're about 10% of all e-commerce in the US. Um, but for anyone listening, if you, you know, if you think about your favorite brands, right now I'm wearing Kiss sneakers, James Purs pants, and a blue salt hoodie. Um, all my favorite brands all have beautiful, incredible online stores, and, and they're all powered by Shopify. Yeah. Honestly, guys, I have to say I love Shopify. Shopify is one of my sponsors, and I'm not just saying this because <laughs> they're one of my sponsors, but I have a Shopify store, and it took us a couple hours to put up the store, and I sell my masterclass LinkedIn course on it. I'm one of the biggest LinkedIn influencers, and we've made over $200,000 in like five months Killer. on our Shopify store just using our built-in community, no paid ads, nothing, just sending people to our Shopify store that took a couple hours to put up. So it's amazing. And you think about, think, you think about that, like that was impossible 10 years ago. 
Yeah, like, and, totally. And, and, and yeah. 20 years ago, that was unfathomable. No one even had the like audacity to even consider, I can start something at my mom's kitchen table or at a coffee shop, and that may become a multi-billion dollar company. When you look at people like, you know, Trina at Figs, or you look at Ben Francis at Gymshark, or Tim and Joey at Allbirds, or, you know, any of these Richard at Fashion Nova, you look at these brands that didn't exist 10 years ago, and today, they're not only great companies, they are leaders in their spaces, in their verticals, in their industries. That never happened before. No one who started a company 10 years earlier was, was a leader in their space in the history of business and commerce and retail until right now. Yeah. And I think one of the main things that I, that really stands out with Shopify is the fact that you have direct access to your customers. So if you're on an Etsy or an Amazon or an eBay, you can't really keep track of your customers or retarget them or send them email campaigns. And that's a really big part of the process when you're trying to build a brand. So I think that's a really big differentiator to me. You know, you, you mentioned this earlier, but um, one of the things that I've been, I've been thinking a lot about and writing a lot about is this idea of, of an entrepreneurial renaissance. And I think the reason that we're living through some of the most interesting times, and, and if you will, if you'll follow me for a second, we are living through an entrepreneurial renaissance is because for the first time ever, the only thing you need right now is ambition. Now, you mm -hmm. have to build a great product or a great service. I mean, th your course is successful, not because of Shopify. Your course is successful because it's a great course and you're delivering a lot of value. But the the opportunity or the ability to bring it to market, to do to have distribution that anybody in the world can buy your course and learn all this amazing new skills, that is, that is powered by technology. And Shopify leverages the technology and the software to, to do this. And you know, you think about just in terms of geographic distribution, you can sell your, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but do, do, you, do you know how many countries your course, uh, people buy your courses in? I can see in Shopify when people are, where people are logging It's in amazing, from. right? It's like you, you, see this incredible, <laughs> you see this incredible map of people all over the world that, that want to consume your products and your services. Again, go back 20 years ago. In order to do that, you had to open up locations in every one of those countries, and now you don't. Mm. And so in many ways, you know, there's a lot more people participating in entrepreneurship today. And so you can sort of say, well, doesn't that mean there's more competition? Well, yeah, certainly. There are more people doing it. But if you are ambitious and you have a great product or a great service and you want to get into the hands of consumers all over the world, there has never been a better time to do so. And I mean, you're already doing so well and 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 that so that that you know you're running with what you're already working on. But but how I think about people who fundamentally like don't know what to do or what to try, they can try five different things. Mm -hmm. And if four fail, that's okay because the cost of failure today is so damn low and they can focus on the one that does work or maybe all five fail and they could try another five things that idea that you can start try your hand at a business that may change your life may change the entire world may change the industry for the price of a couple cups of coffee at starbucks i mean that is incredibly you know compelling and meaningful to me and i i, I think it's remarkable yeah, I think it's I think that's really amazing. The fact that people can iterate until they find something that sticks and then they can invest and scale into the thing that actually sticks and you can fail 10 times and it doesn't really matter and it, it, it's not a big investment like you said. I'm going to touch on that later, but first I want to understand how you climbed your way to become the president at Shopify. So you were always an entrepreneur. You probably had a couple choices after you graduated school, start my own company or join Toby. So how did that all come about? I had this moment, uh, this is going to sound, you know, uh, a little bit dramatic, but it's not. I mean, this is a real, this is a real st true story. Um, there was this moment where I've been, I was sitting in tax law class uh, five minutes from where I'm standing right now in Ottawa. And in a matter of, I think the, the course was three hours. It was a three-hour lecture. Um, in, 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 in that three-hour lecture, I built store 136 on Shopify. Mm -hmm. It was a t-shirt store. And I remember that feeling of hitting the launch button and then getting my first sale probably an hour or two later. And just to be fully transparent, I, I'm pretty sure the first sale came from, I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure that came from like my mom or a friend of mine <laughs> who I was talking to. But that feeling that I was able to build a business in a matter of hours. And then by the time I, like I sat down in the tax law class at the beginning of the lecture as an aspiring entrepreneur. And I walked out of that lecture three hours later as an entrepreneur selling t-shirts all over the world 
that was incredibly, um, that, that changed my life. It changed my life not just because the t-shirts made money. It changed my life because it opened my eyes to what is possible when you marry ambition and technology. What is, mm-hmm. what is possible when you marry a great idea with incredible software? And I think part of it was after that, you know, I, I knew the t-shirt thing was going to be a good thing for me to do from a financial perspective. You know, law school and, and, and business school is expensive. And my, my dad at that point was still not around. Um, and so he's recently come back in my life. But at that point, he wasn't, he wasn't around. And so it helped me do all the things I needed to do in the short term. But in the long run, I think it was quite clear to me now that my life's work, my icky guy, if you will, was going to be helping other people try their hand in entrepreneurship and helping more people experience this idea of self-actualization and independence and survival and creativity through the lens of, of, of business creation. And if I want to do that, there's only, there was only one company that I thought was doing it at any, uh, that had any shot at becoming the world entrepreneurship company. And it was Toby and it was Shopify. And so I finished school and I called Toby as I was finishing and I asked him if I can come and join him and a small handful of others, mostly engineers. And I walked in and said, I'm just here to help. I don't care, you know, what you call me. I don't care what my title is. I don't care about anything. I just want to help build this thing. And for the most part, my, my job for the first couple of years um, was like this kind of Swiss army knife let the engineers and designers and R&D folks build incredible software. And, and we've, we've, we have and have always had some of the smartest people building software here on the design, engineering, development, programming side. Incredible product minds getting together. I mean, Toby's vision around product is, is un- unrivaled, in, in my opinion. Um, but my job was, how can I help? How can I commercialize this? How can I get more people to try it? How can I, you know, we didn't have a CFO when I started. We didn't have a CMO. We didn't have a, a head of, like there was nothing. It was just <laughs> a bunch of people building really great software. And so I've always sort of approached my work here as forget all the bullshit, forget all the, you know, the, um, the swim lanes. Let's just play water polo. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be in the pool playing water polo, ready to catch the ball and, 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 I think I don't know what I don't know what what a goal in water polo is, but but like will like ready to score as many goals as I possibly can, and because I think I found a company whose mission like if you think about Shopify's mission and like my personal Harley's mission, the Venn diagram overlap is almost entire. It's it, it mm-hmm. almost completely overlaps because I care so deeply about entrepreneurship because of what I've I've, I've experienced, what my grand parents experience, what my parents experience. So like, I believe in the value of, of what this is. And there's no company that, that allows me to drive that, you know, to, to have a bigger impact in that vein than Shopify. And that was, um, that was about 14 years ago. And I've been here now for a third of my life. And, and in terms of becoming president, just, you know, I've always sort of looked at my role here as how can I have the biggest impact, um, whether it's you know, starting uh, you know, a, a partner program or referral program for agencies or helping to build the first app store or the theme store or you know, helping to develop Shopify Plus or enterprise offering, uh, going, taking the company public in 2015 on the New York Stock Exchange. I'd never taken a company public before. So therefore, my job was, given the skills that I have, given the, the ways I think I can, I can add value, how can I be as valuable and as impactful as possible through the process? And um, even to this day, you know, my, usually when someone asks me uh, or tells me about a problem, my, 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 first rea- my first answer, my first reaction is, how can I help? And I think if you go mm. about, if you find a place that you really love and you feel like you can do your life's work there, I think it behooves all of us to just, just be too good to ignore, add as much value as you can, and everything kind of takes care of itself that way. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think something in terms of your journey that I took away from is that you don't need to be an inventor or a founder to be an entrepreneur. Like I very much consider you an entrepreneur I do as too. the president of Shopify, even though you didn't necessarily invent or found the company. That's right. Because because yeah. because sometimes it doesn't it doesn't matter necessarily, right? Like I think about this a lot. So Shopify, um, we have we're about ten thousand people at Shopify, and if you think about it, like. A lot of people that work at Shopify really self-identify as entrepreneurs, not just because they think it's cool, because fundamentally, like a lot of us have, like we're, we started companies, we're founders ourselves, we started, we, we have businesses running. I mean, I have this tea company called Firebelly that I started a little while ago during the pandemic that I love. So Shopify very much is a company building software for founders by, like by founders and so you have so many great entrepreneurs working at Shopify. Now, could all of us go out and build our own small companies or even medium-sized companies? Probably. But 
the way to get real scale and real leverage and the way to sort of get the sounds so cheesy, but like the one plus one equals 10 is by all of us sort of combining our efforts, combining our energy, combining our passion, combining our, 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 you know, hours in the day for a single pursuit, for a single mission, which is make mm -hmm. more entrepreneurs, help more entrepreneurs be successful. And I think that you can choose to go do your own thing. You know, some of my um, best friends are, you know, you know, one person businesses or two person businesses that they run and they love that. Um, but I wanted to have a bigger impact and specifically around how do I help more people become entrepreneurs? And again, um, there's no company that does it better. And so I think you have to sort of like, you can work at a company and still be an entrepreneur. You can, totally. you can feel like this is like Shopify has always felt like my baby, but I'm not the founder. Toby's the founder, but Toby has always made me feel like this was also my baby. And that's one of the great parts of working for an incredibly inspiring, thoughtful leader um, and you want to seek those out. You want to you want to look at like you know, are the people that you're working for, the people you're working with, the people that work for you, are you surrounded by people who have the same ambition, drive, and frankly character? And if you do, why would you ever want to leave? And so dismiss some of the spells of your title or you know where you are in the org chart. I I I find that stuff works itself out over time. I didn't start out as Shopify's president. I've worked really hard to to show my value. So, um, and and I I I still believe every single year my job is to requalify for this role. And mm. if next year I don't requalify, then I'm not entitled to have the honor of being the president of this company. And I, I think that's a really great way to think about your careers. Yeah, totally. I know from my own experience. So I'm the president of a company called Yap Media. We're an award winning social media agency. I have a podcast network. And now I have business partners. So I started as the inventor, as a founder by myself. And now I'm giving equity to the people who, like you mentioned, were there to serve from the start. And then eventually, you know, they become your business partners and they're entrepreneurs equally as much as I am, even though they didn't. And you can go so much further now because you have deeply committed people around yeah. you all rowing in the same direction. You can just do so much more that way. Yeah, and they fill my gaps, like where I'm not the most operational. I've got the big ideas, sure. and you know they're the ones executing. A I lot mean, that's of the time. it's so interesting you, you say that, Hala, because I actually think a lot about this. More recently, um, I've been thinking about this. One of the other questions I get is, I'm looking to start a business. I need to find a co-founder. I'm thinking of starting with my like sister, or brother, or friend. Most people end up starting businesses with people that are just like them. In fact, mm -hmm. you, you notice this. Um, if you look at a lot of you know early founding teams, they all went to the same high school together or the same college together. They they lived in the same dorm together, or dorm room together. In the case of Facebook, for example, um, but actually, the people that you want to build a company with, for the most part, need to have very complementary skill sets, mm -hmm. not the same skill sets, but rather like figure out you know everyone's yin to everyone else's yang, and and that is not necessarily the person you were friends with in high school. In fact, it may be the opposite. So if you are, you're listening to this right now and you're in college and you're in a faculty of management business or you're in faculty of engineering, you are probably going to have more success starting, building, scaling a business with someone who is not currently in your faculty. In fact, mm -hmm. I would suggest that it is, you will find more alpha, more leverage, more abilities if you as the engineering student goes across the street to the law school. And then after the two of you get together, you then go across the street to, I don't know, like the like the hospitality faculty. And those are the people you should you should you should get together because all of you are gonna bring something so different to the table that ultimately you are gonna form an incredible relationship and everyone's gonna kind of know their place and what they can work on in a really nice way. Um, which I don't think you'd get if you're just going to start a business with the person that you've hung out with for the last 20 years. Totally. I totally agree. Let's let's talk about the entrepreneurial renaissance. You say that entrepreneurship is having a renaissance moment, and you recently tweeted three reasons. Number one, more people are starting businesses than ever. Number two, creators are the next generation of entrepreneurs building brands. And number three, large established businesses are modernizing their tech stack. So I'd love for you to shed more color on each one of these points and tell us why this entrepreneurship renaissance is happening right now. Well, the fact that more, more people today, so if you look, if you like, don't take my word for it. Let's just look at the actual numbers. If you look at, yeah. if you look at business registrations, um, U.S. business registrations, and you go to the Census Bureau, um, U.S. Census Bureau, it's all public information. They, they have this great PDF. Effectively, since 2004 
till 2018 or 19 or so, you saw approximately 4 million business registrations every year. It's fairly consistent. It's pretty flat. Mm. And then something happened as sort of the pandemic kind of um, came about. You saw this spike. It actually went from 4 million a year to 5 million a year. I mean, that is, you know, that, that's a fairly large jump. And now we're actually sitting at that 5 million uh, mark pretty much every single year. So just from a strictly objective criteria perspective, there are more people today, if you just look at the U.S. alone, starting business than ever before. Then there's two other things. Then there's sort of the, the philosophy. This idea that failure is the successful discovery of something that didn't work as opposed to failure being a scarlet letter that you wear with you, that you, 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 you know, it affects your esteem, it affects your ability to function. That is also changing because the cost of failure is so small. People are not realizing that they may want to try two or three things and see what works and, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall mm. and see what sticks. And the, the spaghetti noodle that sticks, that's what they double down on. So first of all, there, there are, there's less of a connotation, negative connotation that if I start something and it fails, it means I'm a failure. Instead, it feels a lot more like if I start something and it fails, maybe it just wasn't the right thing. Let me try something else. That's the first mm. thing. The second thing is you have this new emergent, uh, I actually uh, tweeted also about this, that you know the creator economy is fake. It's just the economy. Well, um, obviously that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but what I meant by that is usually when you're starting a business, you start with product and then you build an audience. So I want to build the world's greatest pen and I'm going to bake this pen, and then I'm going to go and find people that want to buy this pen. Or using the example earlier, I made this new appliance or this new beautiful blanket, and I'm going to make more of it, and then I'm going to go and sell it. Well, for the first time ever, you actually have people now that first have audiences that are thinking about how can I add more value to my audience? And it's not just, you know, obviously, it, we, all everyone talks about, you know, Mr. Beast, and I have some feastables here, um, but it's not just Mr. Beast. All of us are on, not all of us, a lot of us are on social media. We inherently have audiences. You may have 100,000 followers or you may have five followers, but you have an audience. And if you are putting out content and you're putting out information that is valuable to them, you have a really good relationship with that audience. They, they trust you. They want to hear from you. They want to understand you. And so now if you are, you know, putting out great content about the future of, you know, the skateboard industry, uh, that's one of our new stores, Supreme, which is one of my, like my, my, my Moby Dick was Supreme. I really wanted to get Supreme on Shopify for a very, very <laughs> long time. And finally, now they're, they're on Shopify. So if, if you're putting out great content about the, about the skateboard industry, maybe you should think about designing a skateboard. Or if you're if you have a blog about you know soccer for example and and how you know the soccer industry and soccer coming to America versus the World Cup, maybe you should start selling soccer balls because you know your audience already has an interest in that particular category. So actually, I think this idea of of the creator economy it's just the economy except that there's this, this really cool advantage which is that you have a built-in audience for your products. And maybe third of all, just sort of on the the larger companies. A lot of companies either never sold direct to consumer. If you think about the CPGs, for example, um, Heinz Ketchup has a store on Shopify. Heinz Ketchup never sold direct to consumer. Heinz would sell through a grocery store. But there's some people that really care about, like, they're obsessed with ketchup. They love ketchup. <laughs> and they want to buy direct from Heinz called Heinz at Home. And for the first time ever, those big brands are actually having a direct relationship, whether it's through social media. And if you remember years ago, the Wendy's account was like, had a real personality. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these so social media accounts of big brands actually have personalities to the extent that their, their fans, their consumers want to inter inter interact with them. And so you have a couple things happening with the big companies. One is the big companies are beginning to act a lot more entrepreneurial. They want to have a direct relation mm -hmm. with the consumer, but also they're, they're experimenting. They're trying new things. I, a couple years ago, one of the cool things I thought that Oreo did, which is owned by Mondelez, is you can put for, as a Christmas gift or holiday gift, you can put, you can personalize Oreos. So there's someone in your life that loves Oreos, you can make a, you know, Harley's, Harley's, you know, um, Harley's Oreos, happy holiday, something like that. That is really Cute. interesting. So when you come, so each of those things on their own are kind of interesting. When you combine those things, you see big companies acting very entrepreneurial. You think you, you see creators, uh, just, just on the creator side, think about these artists, like these musicians, people like, um, you know, Drew House uh, with, with Justin Bieber's uh, brand that he built or OVO with Drake has built. You see these, traditional, you know, what would be a traditional musician completely expand their scope of what they're actually building and selling and creating. When I used to go to a concert when I was a kid, uh, I would go to the merch table. It was usually some sort of like 
shitty screen print on some basic t-shirts, like Fruit of the Loom t-shirt, and it said like, I don't know, the Rolling Stones on the back was a bunch of tour, tour dates. Well, now you go to these concerts and you go to like a Drake concert and they're selling like Canada Goose OVO collaboration, collab jackets. <laughs> or you go to, you know, a Pharrell concert and you see some of the crazy stuff he's, he's selling that like, you know, he's selling like cosmetics at the concert that, he, that he's created himself. So big companies are actually entrepreneurial. Artists are now actually expanding from just being uh, artistic creators around music and art and film to actually creating product. Um, and you can even look at the actors and actresses that have done. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have just more people generally becoming entrepreneurs and more people saying, I make amazing chicken soup, and now I'm going to sell that chicken soup to the world. And I think when you combine all those things, you see people that traditionally had not entered entrepreneurship doing so, and they're scaling at a, at a pace that just has never been seen before. And that's why, that's a long answer to a very short question, but that's why I think there's an entrepreneurial um, renaissance happening. Yeah. And I'm going to ask some follow-up questions and and you hit a lot of points. And we talked a little bit about this in the beginning uh, in terms of the fact that it's not as costly to launch a business anymore. It's not as risky. You can iterate. There's not a lot of shame around having a failing business anymore. Um, also, the fact that you just need to be creative yeah. now. To You just need a good idea to launch a business. Um, so I have a couple follow-up sure. questions. One is about women starting businesses. So as I was preparing for this show, I was surprised to learn that more than half of the business owners on Shopify are actually women. 49% of people who started businesses in 2020 were women. So why do you think that women are embracing entrepreneurship? A couple things. Um, I can tell you just my own, my own experiences. So my grandmother became an entrepreneur in her 50s. My maternal grandmother, she, she started a little textile business um, because honestly, she want, my grandfather's business was not going the way uh, the way he wanted and she wants to supplement their income and she was she wanted to actually help with that. She wanted to participate in commerce and the economy. And so she did so, you know, in the sort of the vein of um, forced entrepreneurship. In 2016, my wife and I were, we, we had our, our first child. We had our, our, our daughter Bailey in 2016. And we would take these walks around the block near our house every day with Bailey. She was born in June. So summertime in Canada, very nice. We'd walk around and my wife would say, I wish there was an ice cream shop here. And that conversation sort of evolved into eventually her saying, I'm going to start an ice cream shop. And she ended up building this great, amazing ice cream shop and, and brand called Sunday School. So on a, a, from a personal perspective, a lot of the women in my life have also become entrepreneurs and, and have, have taken an idea or a problem and solved it through entrepreneurship. But I also think that there is far more resources today available to anyone that wants to start an entrepreneur, whether it's a woman or a man or anyone for that matter. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is entrepreneurship can be started from anywhere. And specifically around the time of the pandemic where we were, all, we, we were all sheltering in place, we were all at home, it became clear to people that they can actually translate their energy at home into building a real business. And I think that's why you sort of have this, you know, that's one of the reasons you see so many more people starting businesses because the pandemic gave us a lot of time at home to think about what do we want to do? What do we want to create? How can I share my, my gifts with the world? But I think mm -hmm. the bigger one is this. I think it has a lot to do with mentorship and and role modeling. And I think the, that now that you're not, not only do we have, not only is more than half of the entrepreneurs on Shopify women, you see incredible, like Hala, like you, you see more, all these incredible women, female entrepreneurs that are kicking ass right now. And you're like, wow, I think I can do that too. She kind of looks like me, or that person kind of reminds me of me. And I like, why, like you, you all of a sudden inherit this incredible audacity. And that audacity has allowed more people to participate who otherwise traditionally did not. Whereas in the past, mm -hmm. if you think about entrepreneurs, close your eyes, think about entrepreneurs, you think about like Steve Jobs and you think about like people like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, if, if you're in tech, for example, mm -hmm. you think about mostly dudes because historically yeah. those are the ones that were on the front cover of Forbes and Fortune, all these magazines as the world's greatest entrepreneurs. That's no longer the case anymore. Now you see people like Kylie Jenner, who, whether or not you agree that she was self-made or not, that's a different debate. She is now on the cover of Forbes as one of the youngest billionaires for creating a company, Kylie Cosmetics, 
on her own. And, and I think that is creating this incredible flywheel of more people, more momentum, more participation. And by the way, it's exactly the reason, what you're pointing out is exactly the reason that I ended up joining the board of Operation Hope. Because for me, one of the things that I had in my life, even though the entrepreneurs in my life, my grandparents, my parents, they were not successful, quote unquote, entrepreneurs. They didn't make a lot of money. I knew enough people in my life that were entrepreneurs, that were small business owners, that it didn't feel foreign to me to actually try my hand at it. And what I've realized mm -hmm. through uh, John Hope Bryan, who's the founder of Operation Hope, is that that's not the case for more, most people. Most people don't know entrepreneurs. They don't know anyone who owns their own business. And because of that, their likelihood to start is far less than it would be for someone who actually does know entrepreneurs. The idea that this program that we've created with Operation Hope called One, One Million Black Businesses, 1MBB, is by 2030 to create 1 million new black-owned businesses and, and, and help create one more, one million more black entrepreneurs. And part of it is that those 1 million entrepreneurs, they build great businesses, they're successful. But it also means that more people in those communities who traditionally don't have a lot of entrepreneurs see people that look like them, that speak like them, that act like them, trying their hand at this thing. And that's what we think will create this incredible flywheel of, of expanded entrepreneurship. That's awesome. And where can people find out about Operation oh, Hope? Oh, if, just, just, if you just look up Operation Hope, uh, just operationhope.com you can see all about it um uh, but it, it is it is really amazing and by the way it's 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 mentorship it's education it's money it's assistance if you need an accountant we can introduce you to one if you need to talk to someone to do product photography we have a great list of resources but it helps more people discover something that has been out of reach for a lot of people for a long time and uh and i'm here for it because i think you know, it's not for everyone, but for some people, like entrepreneurship is unequivocally the way they're going to find their life's work. And I think, you know, once you find your life's work and you get a chance to work on it over a period of many decades, um, man, things get really, really fun. Okay. One more follow-up question. So I'm, I know you mentioned the creator economy and the fact that a lot of people are sort of reverse engineering their path towards entrepreneurship. So it used to be you create a product, like you said, then you'd go out and try to find an audience. Now, a lot of people have built in audiences and they try to figure out what product that audience would want. What are the benefits or the advantages of being a creator entrepreneur as opposed to starting with the product first? I think there's something about momentum in, in business creation. And I think what what's, what is easier, it's not easy because business Business creation is not easy. And frankly, entrepreneurship is not easy. Like we're not changing physics here. Most businesses fail. The good news is that now if you fail at something, you can try something else and you're not going to necessarily lose your house, hopefully. Um, but business momentum is a real thing. And here's the best example I can give you. Um, during the pandemic, my, my anxiety levels sort of skyrocketed. I was drinking way too much coffee. I was at home by myself working. Um, so one of my best friends, David Siegel said, Hey, let me actually get you to start drinking more tea. And I never drank tea before. And he's like, I'm going to curate and sort of create this box of really high end, like the best green tea on the planet. And I'm going to create product for you. Like I'm going to make you a, a special Harley box of tea. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with it. I, like I, I, I drink tea every afternoon. I drink coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon. And so I began to tell people very slowly, very sold, very um, uh, subtly, hey, you know, I'm thinking about trying my hand at this little tea company. I'd post something on, on Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn. I'd tell us a few friends. And all of a sudden, people started asking me weeks later, hey, like, how's the tea company going? Are you still doing that thing? Is that I was like, yeah, it's, I'm working on it. It's really cool. Like, I'm going to start in, you know, my, my second Shopify store. My first one was 2006. My second will be 2020. Um, I'm really excited. And then we launched. And I remember when we launched, I had this list in my mind of like, I'm going to send this, the link to like 25 people who've been bugging me for, you know, for all this time, you know, asking me when I'm launching. And those are my first 25 customers. And once I got that, you know, I'm not sure all 25 bought, maybe it was like 18 of them or 12 of them bought, but it just gave me this incredible confidence that oh, maybe, maybe I'm onto something. Now, maybe that was artificial. Maybe that was just luck and maybe, but it gave me the drive to keep going. to so go from chapter one, which is launching to chapter two, which is, okay, now I got to find a real scalable channel of which to find new customers. And that's what I think is so compelling and so fascinating about the creator, the uh, creators turning into entrepreneurs is that they have their 1000 true, true fans already, you know, built in but it has to be authentic. The reason that there's a very famous story of, uh, in the 80s um, of Brad Pitt doing a, uh, creating his own toothpaste, and it failed. 
Well, of course it failed because like nobody associates Brad Pitt. I mean, he's great at a lot of things. I don't, I don't know him, but no one associates him with having especially good dental hygiene. However, um, someone like Mr. Beast, who's well known for loving chocolate, um, who has to eat a particular type of chocolate because he has certain health issues, creating something like Feastables and, 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 and allowing, inviting his audience in to participate in the journey of building it, R&D, samples, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to do next, and then releasing it, obviously he's got a huge audience, but it, he, he turned his subscribers and his, his audience into consumers, into participants, into fans of what he was making. Now, you know, Harley starting Firebelly T versus Mr. Beast could not be, you know, more far apart. I mean, that is like, those are, those are different extremes. But in the middle, I think you have a lot of people who have these built-in audiences and they know what their audience really wants. And if there's something that their audience wants and they want, and they've had dialogue about this, but it doesn't yet exist, that is a perfect opportunity for them to create something brand new and then sell it or offer it to their audience. And maybe it just stays with their audience. Maybe you're, maybe you're only selling pens to the hundred people in your, you know, subreddit pen group, because you're in the subreddit pen group and you always talk about the best pens and you think you've created a better pen. And maybe your only, your entire, your, your total adjustable market is everyone in that subreddit. That's okay. Mm. But maybe that gets you going. Now you're making staplers. Now you're making all types of, you know, now, now you're making notepads and, and pens and paper. And I think that it just gives you a little bit of an early momentum start uh, in, into entrepreneurship. And I think that's why it's really, really compelling. And by the way, it's the reason why I think some of these celebrity brands, even some of them that get a bad rap, I, I don't believe all of them deserve a bad rap. I mean, I, I, I was very close to uh, to Jimmy Butler creating Big Face Coffee. Um, I just, I remember like early days when he first contacted Shopify, he was making coffee in the NBA bubble uh, for other uh, uh, basketball players because there was no good coffee there. And then decides after you know, the NBA bubble opens up and people go back to their towns, that he wants to create Big Face Coffee brand. And then I remember hearing from um, someone at Shopify who, worked who works very close to them that he's actually going on a, on, a, on a coffee tour to go find better beans and better ingredients and better product and better accessories for the coffee. And I realized that this is not a promotional product. This is not Brad Pitt selling toothpaste. This is genuinely someone who cares so deeply about coffee, making a better version of coffee and coffee products and selling to the people that also like Jimmy. And maybe you only know Jimmy as a basketball player, but now there are people in this world who really only know him as a coffee entrepreneur. And I think that is so cool. Yeah. I love the creator economy because I think, I, you know, I coach people all the time on how to start businesses. And a lot of people just don't have product market fit. That's what I see a lot. They're putting out a product. Nobody wants to buy it. They don't have product market fit. When you're a creator, you can pulse your audience survey them, get to know what they want. You can pay attention to what they're asking you. You can iterate as you want. You can like build it as you go. So there's a lot of uh, advantages there. So let's talk about another concept that you talk about, and that's uh, connect to consumer and the future of e-commerce. Yeah. So, so I heard you on Bloomberg. Uh, you talked about the future of e-commerce moving from D to C, direct to consumer to C to C. Can you talk to us about that and why you think things are changing? You remember how we talked earlier about... Um, that for a period of time, there were consumers that were interacting with Wendy's, like the, the Wendy's, the fast food chain, almost like Wendy was a person. Mm -hmm. So something dramatic has changed, and I, I don't think it's, it's, it's obvious, but I do think it's profound. Um, and what has changed is that every time we as a consumer buy a product, we're not just buying it for consumption reasons, we're also voting with our wallet for that product to exist in the world. The reason that I wear Allbirds um, I think they're great shoes, high quality. But I believe what Joey and Tim are doing with Allbirds to create a more sustainable sneaker is fundamentally amazing. And I want to vote with my money, with my wallet, for more of that to exist, whether it's Allbirds or it's other brands like Allbirds. The reason I wear James Purse is because I think there's no one who thinks more about, you know, black t-shirts than this guy and his team. And I, I, I love people that are craft people that think so deeply about a particular thing. And so every time I buy a James Purse t-shirt, which is quite expensive, it feels like I'm endorsing this idea. And so I think today consumers have a very different relationship with the products, the brands, the companies that they buy from, far beyond anything we've seen in the past. It actually reminds me of what we used to see 150 years ago, where you as the consumer went to the bakery and bought the bread from the baker. 
and you knew the baker's name and you knew their family and you knew what their birthday and, or you went to the cobbler to have your shoes fixed and you knew the cobbler's, you know, you knew the cobbler's family, you knew the cobbler's life story. So that sort of town square model made commerce and retail very, very personal, very intimate in a really wonderful way. And then, frankly, for the last 150 years or so, we had these big department stores, which, you know, felt a little bit um, transactional. Whereas today, I think we're coming back to a more personal, intimate, authentic buying experience between consumer and brand or consumer and maker. And for that reason, I think the brands that you and I uh, love so much, it's not just the product that we're buying. We're buying a participation in that community. I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing, but like, you know, you buy a pair of sneakers on, you know, on, on, on Kith, for example, or on Noble, for example, and now you're kind of part of the Kith community. Now you're following them on Instagram as well. You're going to their pop-up events. If they have, you know, some sort of uh, early release at midnight on a Sunday night, you're, you're staying up late and you're on, you're on the chats and you're on, you're on social media and you're talking to other people that are waiting for the drop to come. Um, I mean, the Supreme community is a perfect example of that, right? Every Thursday at 11 a.m., this massive massive Supreme flash sale happens, you're not just buying something from, from Supreme. You're participating in the Supreme community in a way that is just unlike anything we've seen in, you know, a hundred years, for the last hundred years or so. And so I think the brands that do really well have a deep understanding of that connection and they connect right to the consumer through multiple touch points in store, online, on social media, at farmers markets, through media, through concerts. I mean, brands are now putting out and making these mixtapes effectively on Spotify. I mean, that is like, so, so not only do I love Supreme and I love their skateboards but, and I wear their hoodies, but I'm listening to their playlists and then I can go on a, a, you know, a community forum. I can go on their discord channel and I can talk to other people like that. That is connect to consumer. And that, by the way, is a much more interesting and exciting way for retail to operate. And I, I'm here for it. Yeah, I love it. That's awesome. Okay, my last question to you is um, 2023, you call it the year of the entrepreneur. We're approaching a recession. A lot of people, you know, would assume it's not a good time to start a business, but you say otherwise. Tell us why and your top advice for people starting businesses in 2023. I mean, I, I think I, I've gone through a couple things that are just, I have to say, and I'll say it again, one is the cost mm -hmm. of failure being so low. You can try something today. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, you, you may lose $39, but like, you know, think about the impact you might have, like what may be the case if that actually is successful. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when I started my t-shirt business store 139 on Shopify in 2006, the main ingredient for me to be successful was I needed a lot of money because I needed to buy ads on AdWords on Google. The more money that I made, the more money I spent on AdWords, the more money I made. It was a sort of this, this virtuous cycle, back and forth. Um, today, having more money is not necessarily going to lead to any success whatsoever. What is going to lead to more success is how good your product? How do you connect with your consumers? What kind of community have you built? What kind of content are you creating? Um, that means that more people can participate and can start businesses, but it also means more people can build huge companies with few resources by simply being resourceful. So creativity over capital and resourcefulness over resources. That to me is, is incredibly compelling. And then I'll go one step further, which is that today, if you look at all the surface areas, digital surface areas or physical surface areas where consumers are spending their time, from TikTok to Pinterest, from Spotify to YouTube, all of these are these wonderful opportunities to engage, to have conversations. I mean, you know, if, if I was starting Firebelly today versus two years ago, I would probably spend a lot more of my time, um, I know YouTube comments are kind of a weird place sometimes, but I would find some great videos on YouTube where people are talking about getting really geeky and really ner like nerding out on tea. And I would participate in those conversations. And eventually after, you know, creating value for that community, I may say, hey, you should check out what I'm doing with Firebelly Tea. I think it's really compelling. That is a very different way to build a business. Um, as, an, as an aside, I started a little personal project, um, sort of my weekend project for the last couple, last couple of months has been this podcast called Big Shot. And Big Shot is an archival of um, some of the greatest Jewish entrepreneurs that have lived in the last hundred years. And I'm trying to archive these stories uh, before it's too late, before the people aren't around. And when you hear these people that have built these crazy companies like Izzy Sharp building Four Seasons or Aldo Benson and creating Aldo Shoes, you realize that starting a business in 
the 40s and 50s and 60s and frankly even the 70s was really really tough. I mean, it was a bloodbath and if you didn't if you didn't succeed, you lost everything and the only way for you to really build was to bring on partners and raise money and capital. That's not the case anymore. Some of my most favorite stores on Shopify started at their mom's kitchen table. They're totally bootstrapped. They haven't raised any money. They're a one or two person operation and they're Taken a, you know, I mean, think, look at Viore or Allo Yoga or Gymshark. Think about how competitive they are to, to Nike. And some of these companies are like five years old. I mean, this mm -hmm. is an unbelievable time to start a business. And it's because it's easier to start and it's easier to scale. And if you, and this is where the advantage goes to the entrepreneur. Because if you deeply care about what you are building and providing in terms of value service product to the consumer, you're going to win because it's, it's a lot easier for you to be authentic and for you to be the, like, for you to actually get in front of, of, of potential consumers versus, you know, a big company with a big brand. Yeah. I'm fired up, guys. Uh, if, if, you, if you don't consider this your sign, I don't know what you're waiting for. Start your small business. Start your small company. If you guys want to get a $1 per month trial, you can go to Shopify.com slash profiting, all lowercase. Harley, it was such a pleasure. The last question I ask all my guests. Two last questions. We do something fun at the end of the year. What is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? The first thing I would say is is try try your hand at a couple of different things. Like this this idea of throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, it, it's not just a, a fun thing to say. Like try a bunch of different things. Even if you have a business that like I don't know if I'll, if I'm if if Firebelly ever becomes a big company or not, but like at some point I'm going to try my hand at coffee because I've I've done the tea thing really well. Maybe we expand to coffee. Do I need to know? But like who knows? Maybe it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, I can stick to tea. And if it does work, now I have two product lines. Try stuff. Like the, the the fact that you can do so right now with limited risk and you can discover things that don't work as as the new definition of failure. Just go ahead and do it. And by the way, if you don't know what to start, you're not really sure what to sell. Look at the stuff you're using. Look at your desk right now. Like I got lots of notepads and I got lots of pens here and coffee mugs and stuff. I mean, like if I were to start something, like I'd look around and be like, I need like, why do post-its not like, they're just flimsy. I want a better version of a post-it. I'm going to go and try to tinker in my garage in my little workshop at home. And I'm going to try to make a better version of that. But find the stuff that you're already using or the things you're already making and think about what other people want to consume that as well. Mm, that's great advice. And my last question is, what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can be outside of profiting financially. Um, I think the most important decision any of us make is our spouse or our, our, our life partner, wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever you want to call that person. Um, I don't think enough people, I think more people spend more time a lot of people spend more time contemplating what car they're going to drive or what kind of sneakers they want to buy uh, and, 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 and not enough time thinking about um, choosing the right life partner. And uh, I, I'm fortunate that I have, I think, the greatest life partner for me uh, in Lindsay, who's my wife, um, because there's no way I can live at this level of, of energy, of excitement, of, of just get shit done without having this incredible foundation that is, that is Lindsay. And I would encourage all of you to think deeply about that. If you have someone... Um, cherish that person because um, that is, that's kind of the secret to this whole thing. That's so funny. You know, people have been mentioning that um, on my podcast way more frequently. There's always like themes that pop up every year and relationships and and picking the right spouse is definitely- It, ma it matters. Lindsay and I have so been, far. I'll just I'll get a little vulnerable for yeah. a second before we close. Lindsay and I have been seeing, a, we have been seeing a couples therapist since we got married. That's how like, like, just like you, you know, you go to the gym before you need to go to the gym, right? Like we've been seeing a couples therapist bi-weekly for nine years or so, because we really believe that if that is, if that centerpiece of our life, which is our marriage, our relationship is not strong and sturdy and durable, nothing else matters. You need to have a foundation of strength to do all this other stuff. Whether, by the way, you're an employee or a founder, an entrepreneur, you're a doctor, lawyer, you're, you know, whatever, you're an artist, whatever you do, you need to have that strong foundation. And, I, and the more I talk to people about that, the more I realize that most people have not contemplated how important that particular person is in your life. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Harley. This has been such a great conversation. Where can everybody learn more about you and everything that you do? Uh, Harley, at Harley F on Twitter, at Harley on Instagram. And of course, check out Shopify.com if I can be helpful to anyone, anyone who's listening that is starting a business now. Um, I can't promise you I can give you that much time, but uh, please, please send me a tweet at Harley F or an Instagram DM. Um, and I would love to be your first customer. So if you launch something on Shopify, Aww. let me be your first customer. Just send me uh, a tweet or a DM and I'd love to do that for you.
What what a great way to close. Cool. Thank you so much, Harley, for your time. Thank you so much for having me.